Welcome everybody to this Good Food Hub session. Uh, we're today focused on biofortified foods as a business opportunity. Uh, for those of you uh, having their, your first call with the Good Food Hub, we're a kind of global community of small businesses trying to make food more nourishing, more sustainable, more equitable and more resilient. And uh, we were born out of the UN Food Systems Summit last year. Uh, we uh, currently have our sponsors at EIT Food through some EU funding for this year. And this event is a rather wonderful partnership with Harvest Plus, who for the last decade have been trying to, well, have been managing to uh, apply science to biofortified crops and then uh, pushing them out into the market. So they're reaching people with better nutrition. Um, and we're going to hear more about that soon. So the call agenda today is, um, is going to be, we're going to hear a little about better opportunity from Ben and Jenny. And then we're going to have a chat with some entrepreneurs who've been doing this uh, in, the, in the real world. So what's their experience? And then we'll come back to, to Jenny and Ben, who are going to share a little bit of what it takes to go to market. And then we'll go into breakout groups. So you've got a chance to both talk to the experts and talk to the entrepreneurs and ask them any questions you have about what, what it would take perhaps to, to take this and apply it where you are. Um, yeah, so uh, I think, let me just, actually, I was just going to have a look, see we've got calling in. We've got select folks from Nigeria and India, um, Malawi, good to have you here from Malawi. Um, yeah, so lovely to have you all here. If you, if you want to add an introduction to yourself in the chat box there, that would be super. But uh, let me start by handing over to Jenny Walton and Ben, I don't know if I, your, your last name, I might stumble over your last name, Uchitelli Pierce. Uh, you can, you, you can, you can. Tell me how that said in a second. Uh, who are both um, part of the Harvest Plus team, and they're going to share some of their insights on uh, the opportunity to buy fortified foods. Let me hand over to you. Thank you. Ben, do you want to introduce Thanks, yourself Ian. first, and then I'll, I'll carry on? Sure, I'll go ahead. So, my name is Benjamin Ushantel Pierce. I work with Harvest Plus. Um, and I've been working with Harvest Plus for, for some years now on developing partnerships and helping businesses commercialize biofortified crops. Uh, we're a publicly funded entity, but we know, <clears throat> know that it's fundamental to work with private sector in order to scale up commercially and sustainably. I'm very happy to be here today. Jenny? Thanks, Ben. Hi, everyone. And uh, nice to be part of this um, new network. Um, my name is Jenny Walton. I'm based in um, the Harvest Plus team in Washington, D.C. We're, we're part of IFRI in, in Washington. Uh, I've been at Harvest Plus now for about um, five years. Um, my background is, is nutrition and working in food businesses. So I've worked in food businesses of all different shapes and sizes in many different countries, from small startup um, restaurants, to big multinationals and um, I really love food and I love um, selling food and being part of organizations that, um, that sells food. And whilst I've been in um, the private sector up until I started at Harvest Plus, I still see you know, what I do at Harvest Plus as, as selling food. Um, and being a nutritionist um, where we have a product that is so healthy and has the potential to change lives and food systems and businesses. Um, it's, a, it's a really great place to be for a nutritionist with um, a commercial background. So we have a few slides uh, to go through with you today. Um, so the first part, we want to give you what the context of what biofortification is. And you can kind of look at biofortification through two different lenses. And one of them is the role of biofortification in tackling global hidden hunger and the problem that we're all dealing with um, that's actually getting worse because of, of COVID um, and what we need to do and what we can do in the food system to help alleviate hidden hunger. 
then I'll talk about Harvest Plus and who we are and how our involvement in, in this. And then we'll get into the biofortification in the commercial context and talk about the, the 12 crops or, or products and the countries that were available. Then we'll hear from, from our um, entrepreneurs who were in biofortification. And then as Ian said, ben, uh, ben and I will talk more about actually, you know, how to go to market with biofortified foods and how we can help. So um, biofortification, um, in the sense that the Har Harvest Plus program and what we're doing at the moment, biofortification is the process of increasing the vitamin and mineral content of crops and, and any other foods through um, breeding or agronomic practices. So that the foods naturally contain a better source of, of micronutrients. So at the moment, the Harvest Plus program uses varieties that have been developed through conventional breeding, but there are many other technologies that you can use, including genetic modification, even irradiation. There's lots of things that you can do to food to actually increase or boost the nutrient content without having to add it post-harvest. But in the Harvest Plus context, um, we don't work on any um, GM varieties um, for lots of different reasons, for um, political reasons, for regulatory reasons, but also consumer reasons and that consumers are still not there yet in, in terms of um, genetic modification understanding. So the actual term biofortification can be quite confusing to consumers and people in, in businesses. So whilst Ben and I will talk about biofortification and the events called biofortification. We don't recommend to use the term biofortification with consumers. Just the end benefit, which is about a natural source of uh, nutrition. So you'll still hear biofortification used as terminology in, in meetings like this and, and when it's talked about in public health terms. But when we start talking to consumers, we, we tend to use different terminology. So hidden hunger, it's um, still a major problem that we're dealing with and in, it's a crying shame that in this day and age that we're still having these um, these numbers of um, uh, malnutrition in the world. You know, a quarter of the world suffers from uh, micronutrient malnutrition and um, these are the actual costs to countries of, of the burden of, of malnutrition. Um, the biggest um, concerns being iron, vitamin A, and and zinc, and as you say, it's getting worse because of, of COVID, because of climate change, because of, of of many reasons. So even though we were all working really hard on on the SDGs, we've still got to work harder and faster to actually um, make a dent in in these uh, numbers. And it's it's not just developing countries who are um, seeing this. Um, these problems with malnutrition, it's all countries. So at the same time, you can have um, obesity, you can have micronutrient deficiency as well. So whilst biofortification has um, a huge benefit for countries and consumers um, uh, in Africa and um, Asia, there are, it has benefits for consumers everywhere. And then in the bigger picture of what you can do about hidden hunger, um, nutrient enrichment of staple foods or biofortification is at the bottom of the py pyramid there. So it's the first line of defense really in tackling um, hidden hunger because the foods that people eat the most of become naturally more nutritious. So you're increasing the baseline of what everybody's eating. Everybody is always going to eat bread. Um, Italians are always going to eat pasta and, and pizza. Americans are always going to eat burgers. You're not going to change people's diet. What if we work on dietary diversity and ensure that everybody has access to the same fruits, vegetables, milk, and eggs that in, in globally, but people are still going to eat staples. So we have to improve the nutrition content of the foods that people eat the most of, and we can do these other interventions as well. So large-scale food fortification, which is the addition of vitamins and minerals to food after harvest. And then supplementation, which is providing um, new micronutrients to consumers in sachets or tablets for really um, a, a problematic malnutrition. 
So in general, the causes of hidden hunger are poverty. So when um, we've all had times in our life where we might not have had as, as much money that we, we would like, you spend more of your money on food and then the food that you buy are, is, is less expensive. So you cut back on luxuries and you tend to eat things that are cheap like rice and pasta um, and, and bread and you eat more of those. So 60% of the calories in the world come from those three major staples. You know, there's an absolute abundance of food out there, but we're, the, the humans in general still getting their calories from the same um, basic staples. So we have to increase the nutrient density of the foods that people are eating the most of. This is more like the background of, of, of biofortification in this sense. And now we'll start to talk more about how we actually brought that to life as a, as a, as a public health intervention. And then we'll talk more about the commercial side. So, um, Ben? Thanks, Jenny. As Jenny was saying, um, everyone around the world gets the majority of their calories from these staple crops. They're really the backbone of the food system. Farmers grow them, processors process them, and consumers eat them. So where does Harvest Plus come in? Harvest Plus's founder, Howdy Buas, uh, who you can see here, asked this question. If staple crops are the backbone of the food system, if businesses are already working with them, if farmers are already growing them, how can we make those staple crops more nutritious? Can we help smallholder farmers around the world who eat what they grow produce nutrition on their own farms? And can we involve private sector businesses in the commercialization process to work with those actors who are already within the food system? As Jenny was saying, this is something that is going on around the world. Um, Biofortified crops have been released in over 100 countries. Uh, or, or in testing in over 100 countries um, and released in many more or um, in many countries. And you can see the different crops that are available here. There's sweet potato, banana plantain, maize, cassava, beans, pearl millet, cow pea, Irish potato, sorghum, lentil, rice, and wheat. As you can see, these are really the main staples and these staples naturally have nutrition in them. This is just about increasing the amount of nutrition in them through breeding, as was noted earlier. And you can see here a, a list of some of the countries where biofortified crops are available, uh, either in testing or released. And if you're interested in any uh, details on specific crops in specific countries, Harvest Plus is the organization to reach out to to find out more about the availability of these nutritious crops. We're excited to work together and continue to work with food system actors to scale up these crops. As I was explaining, we first had to discover, is it possible to breed crops that are in fact more nutritious? And Harvest Plus spent our time, our first phase, discovering these more nutritious crops. How is this done? This is done by looking through the seed banks because Harvest Plus is part of the international public seed bank system and you screen the more nutritious varieties of those crops. You find the more nutritious varieties. Sometimes these varieties are available right in the communities where, where farmers are already growing and eating them and need them, but sometimes they might be available in a nearby country or need to be bred in order to be more disease resistant and drought tolerant. That's where we moved into the development phase, breeding these more nutritious crops in partnership with local uh, departments of agriculture. Uh, so, so working together with, with departments of agriculture around the world to bring this technology uh, to market. Once we developed these crops, then we moved into the delivery. How do you get these crops into farmers' fields? How do you get them into processing uh, units? How do you ensure that consumers are eating them? And that's really why we're here today, because we recognize that the private sector are actors that are driving a large portion of the food system. And we're excited to work together to bring this technology to market together with private sector in order to, to benefit consumers and really scale in a sustainable uh, profit-oriented and nutrition-oriented manner. Uh, because our goal is reaching a billion consumers by 2030. This is many, many people around the world, but this is something that we can truly achieve 
by working together in partnership. And we're excited to talk to you all today about doing that together because we know we all have shared values and shared interest in bringing more nutrition to the food system. Biofortification isn't just a good idea, it's also something that really appeals to, to many types of, of stakeholders, consumers uh, as well. Um, many markets are moving towards a, a meat-free diet, that's something that appeals to some consumers, and biofortification plays a really important role there because those, those plants that are used in those products need to be more nutritious. Also, consumers are interested in the clean label. They don't want to see many ingredients on a product in, uh, ingredient label. And so biofortification allows businesses to remove things like synthetic fortificants and have a more natural alternative to providing nutrition. And that's the last uh, two there is that it, biofortification is a natural process. It's a natural source of vitamins and minerals. As Jenny was saying, we don't speak to consumers about biofortification. All they need to know is that this is a more nutritious product. It's good for them and it's good for the world. It's good for, for farmers. It's good for, for everyone within the food system. And we're excited to, to work together to continue to make this uh, scale up globally. So I think we're, we have done some great work uh, working with some businesses and we're excited to bring some of those businesses here today with us to speak to you about their experiences commercializing biofortified crops. Fantastic, Ben. That's um, that's great. Uh, it's really inspiring to hear what seems like pretty powerful natural technology in a way that's going to help improve a lot of people's nutrition around the world. So, um, yeah, we're going to move on and actually hear a few uh, sort of testimonies from entrepreneurs that have been doing this. So we've actually we've got Edna Akpan, who's a commercial farm director in Nigeria and uh, also a, a champion for Harvest Plus um, biofortified crops. And we're also going to hear from Evan Rochford, who's the CEO of Nutrimaze, that's bringing non-GMO orange corn to, to a US market. Um, so uh, yeah. Shall we, how about we start with you, Edna? I don't know if you, you, you take yourself off mute and uh, it'd be lovely to see your face as well. Uh, maybe, Ben, if we can turn off screen sharing, then we'll... Uh, fantastic. So, Edna, I'd love to hear a bit yeah. of your story. Like, what was it that led you to adopting some biofortified crops on your, your farm and seeing that applied elsewhere? And... What's that journey been like for you as an entrepreneur, kind of beginning to bring that, those crops to, to, to consumers? Thank you very much for the opportunity given me. I am speaking from Nigeria. And um, as um, a Harvest Plus partner in uh, Nigeria, we've done tremendously well here in Nigeria, especially in the southern part of Nigeria and other parts too. Um, we are uh, saddled, you know, Harvest Plus have given us nutrient-dense um, staple foods, especially in uh, major staple foods like a cassava, that is a major food, then a bio-fortified bio orange flesh sweet potato, and then the maize. Every household consumes this in one form or the other. And this had been spread, you know, the method of multiplication from the rapid multiplication techniques and then, you know, we had to dem had demo, uh, demo farms across all the villages and the states in the south-south. And then we now moved over to be sure that these materials are readily available. This food is readily available within the households for their consumption. The level of adoption is very high here in the southern part because we know that malnutrition has been one of our greatest problems, especially in the rural areas in Nigeria. So Harvest Plus, having come in to work with us with this um, nutrient-dense food, has really improved the well-being of the people in the household. And then we have a lot of cooperatives, groups, organizations, NGOs that have come to partner with us in area to help in the dissemination of this. And a lot of advocacy had been done. And in Aquaimum State in particular, the government have, have really, uh, you know, made biofortification 
a line budget now in the state. So it's a plus for us. Yes, it's a plus for us because people that have been agitating to have access to these biofortified crops have been able to get them. And we have also processed and added value to this, especially for women, maybe winning formula that we use in winning our babies from the mothers, the breastfeeding babies from the mothers. So we have been able to incorporate a combination of either the uh, orange flesh sweet potato or the vitamin A cassava uh, and uh, vitamin A maize flour incorporated into their meals. And the nutritious uh, status of the children and the lactating mothers, even the elderly people, have really come up in the state. So we have a very strong um, um, uh, impact and um, you know a positive impact in the state. Apart from that, the state governments have now built a bulk fortification center in Akwaibom states where we have, you know, from farm to table, production components, the processing components, and then, um, you know, value addition components where these products are being packaged into various fruit, food, and then you can see some of them uh, being sold out, and then it is within the reach of the people, and the demand for it is very high now. So a lot of farms, there is virtually no farmer in our domain that you will ask about vitamin A cassava or, you know, biofortified maize, that they will not tell good stories about it. So for us, it's a blessing for us to, you know, uh, uh, collaborate as a state. And during the Nutritious Food Fair, the state government, we actively involved in all the activities and the trainings we had to conduct through the entire value chain. And the training and the support that we get from the state government was quite encouraging. So for us, even in the university, for example, all the, every year we turn out over 500 students on sideways. That is a practical year program where we put them in the field. They actually cultivate this um, biofortified crops, and then they go over to process it, add value to it, and then we spread it to other nooks and crannies within the southern part of Nigeria. So for me, it is a blessing for us in this, guys, because not that we didn't really have those major staples, but most of those major staples were not enriched with the, um, you know, the, the vitamins and the, those uh, hidden minerals that were lacking. It was merely, you know, starchy foods and so on. So we really want to thank, um, yes, for giving us this opportunity. And we want to have a continuous partnership. For some other states, we've even gone beyond this to commercialization. We have the Smart Mothers Initiative that we have now. Mothers are being brought in and then they are being taught about this, uh, about fortified nutrient dense foods, so that at the end of it, they have become ambassadors in their various domain, in their various communities. And we have talked to the chiefs, you know, the elders, the leaders, even in the churches, in the schools, both the tertiary, in primary, and so on. So it's everywhere now. Is the way to go. And uh, there is no family that does not as consume this uh, nutrient dense food in one form or the other in a day. That's, fan that's fantastic. Um, so excited to hear the impact it's having on communities and the reach you've had. I'm, a lot of people on this call are entrepreneurs from different countries around the world. I'm curious, you know, who's some of those folks will be doing this in a way that is both driven by that kind of benefit of better nutrition, but also um, needing a business that's going to make some money. How have you seen, who, where are the entrepreneurs that are coming in and actually running this as a business opportunity? Have you seen benefits for them, kind of commercial benefits from adopting this? A whole lot of commercial benefits. Example is the child's food. That is being run by Reverend Sister Matilda Young that we trained from Harvest Plus, our headquarters, and then she's been able to step down that training here in the southern part of the country. And now, you know, we produce, like I said, a lot of um, uh, baby winning formulas, a lot of uh, biofortified foods, you know, the gari, the fufu, the high quality cassava flour from it, and then the maize flour, the biofortified um, orange flesh sweet potato in diverse form. Even the leaves, the leaves of the uh, orange uh, flesh sweet potato is now being used as vegetables at home and okay. has a lot of vitamins, yes. So nothing is left, nothing is wasted. We recycle everything. You, leave, you use the leaves, 
we use the tubers and also we use the vibes to cultivate this um, orange flesh sweet potato. So for us, we are blessed to have this come to mm -hmm. our uh, to our domain because actually we had a lot of uh, malnutrition cases in this state, and this has also helped to step up the you know the health status of the people. Great. Well. Um... I can see on the uh, in the chat, people are very curious about how they get to tap into this. Jenny and Ben, I think you're going to come in at the towards the end about actually some really practical ways you can um, kind of access the you know, to, to participate. So we'll hear more of that kind of practical stuff on the other side. But it's great to see people putting messages saying, "Oh yeah, how do I do this? I'm ready." Um, but maybe let's let's just move on to a different perspective. Evan Evan Rushford, who's the CEO of Nutrimaze. Um, let me just, uh, I'm going to put you on mute, Ed, then. I think I was getting some feedback there. Anyway, so, um, Evan, you know, we've heard from Edna in Nigeria in very specific context. It's taking, um, you know, she's taken by the four five crops to market there and it's really taken off. You're in a totally different context. We fascinated to hear your journey in the US. Well, it's taken for you. You know, why did you adopt this, and how are you going to market? What's your entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, yeah. So um, we have kind of a unique situation. Um, so my my co-founder and father. I think we're getting some feedback from. Yeah, there we go. Um, there go. That should be better. My my co-founder and father is um, Professor Torbert Rochford of Purdue University. Evan, you just went quiet for me. Is it? Yeah, I've lost Evan too. I've lost okay. your audio. We could hear you. Um, we can see you, Evan, but we can't hear you. Yeah, we'll just have to do sign language. Yeah. <laughs> That's better. There you go. All right. Sorry. My, for some reason, my headphones decided to not cooperate. Um, Anyway, so I was saying my co-founder and father is uh, Tor Professor Torbert Rochford. He um, is sort of kind of the, the grandfather of Orange Maze. He started working on it in the mid-1990s and then started working with uh, Harvest Plus, um, you know, and it's, it's at its founding in the early 2000s. And, and so, you know, Torbert and his colleagues had spent all this time, uh, you know, developing discoveries and germplasm that could be shared with international breeding centers and adapted to, to Africa um, and, you know, other places in the world. And um, in, around, in 2015, we started the business here in the U.S. And, and part of our inspiration was um, uh, often when, when Orange Maze is introduced uh, to new areas, people will ask, well, if this is, you know, this is so good and nutritious, like, do you guys eat it in America? And, you um, you know, we did it, right? And they're like, well, why not? You know, and then so then we were like, why not? You know, why are you know if this is if this is more nutritious? Why are we not eating it in the U.S.? Because you know, as Jenny talked about, you can be um, you can be uh, sufficiently nourished in terms of calories, um, but but you know, not sufficiently nourished in terms of nutrient uh, nutrients. And so um, while we don't have vitamin A deficiencies typically in the United States, um, as we dug into um, you know, sort of the literature, we, we, we started to see that there actually are um, pretty significant deficiencies of other carotenoids, lutein and zeaxanthin, um, that are really important for, for protecting our eye health as we age. Um, and basically, if you don't get enough of them, you're at a much higher risk of losing your vision to age-related macular degeneration, which is the leading cause of vision loss um, throughout high-income in countries. And so, um, you know, because sort of a light bulb went off uh, for us that there, and then we, we started um, you know, milling the product and testing it. And we found not only was it more nutritious, it was also better tasting. And so then we said, okay, well, you know, now there's, there's a, there's, you know, potentially a compelling commercial opportunity. And so, um, you know, we, we, we're, we're um, in some ways quite different from a lot of um, other businesses commercializing biofortified crops because, um, you know, whereas the international breeding centers had developed varieties adapted to Nigeria and, and you know Zambia and other areas, um, we were starting basically with the research, you know, the product of Torbert's research, and so we've actually had to start our own breeding program to implement orange corn, um, you know, at, at a commercial scale in the United States. And so 
Um, you know, we've gotten funding from the U.S. government to do that, um, and and that's going really well. Um, but sort of in the in the meantime, while we're working on improving the yield and the productivity um, within the United States Corn Belt, um, we said, what can we do, right? So we started milling the corn and selling it as a as a product. Um, you know, grits and cornmeal and corn flour. So grits are similar to you know just your your grain porridge, your corn porridge that. Um, you know, is, is, is used by a lot of different cultures throughout the world. Um, and that's been a really interesting, um, interesting journey. And I think it's, we've learned a lot because, you know, um, in the U.S., um, you know, there is, you know, in the South, in the Southern United States, a lot of people do eat grits, but um, it's really, it's very different from in a lot of places where, you know, people are eating corn porridge, you know, every single day and it's their main sort of uh, staple you know, in the U.S., it's um, it's it's not quite that way, and so um, you know the velocity at which people purchase the product um, is not necessarily that high, right? Someone might buy might buy, buy a bag of grits and they love the product and they're big fans of it, but it takes them you know maybe it takes them a month or two or three you know to get through it, depending on how how many times they eat it, right? If they eat it once a week or if they eat it once a month, right? And so um, we. We're now looking at now that our um, now that we have varieties that are starting to to be more um, productive. We're looking at how can we um, work with other businesses to use orange maize to um, deliver more nutrition to the U.S. population through food like processed foods and um, and actually uh, one of our most promising applications is actually poultry feed because. In the U.S., um, you know, chickens eat about six times more corn than humans, and uh, egg yolks are uh, the, the the dark color comes from the same carotenoids that make orange corn orange. And so, if you feed, we've done a lot of research on this. If you feed orange corn to chickens, it makes the chickens healthier and more productive, and it makes the eggs darker and more nutritious. Um, and and that's actually a really great way to deliver carotenoids in the U.S. because the per capita consumption of eggs is 270 eggs per person, and so. Um, it's, um, it's kind of a, 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 a next, a next level downstream sort of form of biofortification. Um, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because there's a lot of parallels, um, with what's going on, uh, around the world. There's also a lot of sort of different, um, constraints and needs and opportunities. So, um, it's a fun product to work on. Thanks, Evan. It's fantastic. I've got. I've got five chickens in my backyard. I clearly need to be buying your chicken feed. Um, <laughs> um, what I actually listened to in your story um, and Edna's is that the difference in different markets that, you know, the sort of whether it's because of the um, nutritional kind of deficiencies, they're different. So the starting point is different or whether it's because actually the market's different, what people are consuming are different, how they consume. And so, you know, you as an entrepreneur, both starting with perhaps the simplest thing, which mm -hmm. is just um, grit, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, but then figuring out as you've got that base, going on a journey, say, so well, actually, how do we really take this to market at a scale that's going to work here in this context? And I imagine, I know we've got people from uh, just looking at the names, I'm guessing we've got West Africans and East Africans and uh, Indians and Bangladeshis on this call. Um, so people from all over the place, and it'll be very different from depending on where you are as what your journey is to kind of get the right product and take it to market. Um, which is probably actually a signal that it's the right time to kind of jump onto the next part of this call, which is actually um, how to go to market. Um, and Jenny and Ben, you were going to take a little bit through some of the experiences you've had of working with entrepreneurs around the world on that. Um, feel free to tap into Edna and Evan again if you want to bring in some of their experiences as you do so. But uh, yeah, it'd be great to hear what does it actually take for somebody to take this to market? Jenny and Ben, you're both on mute. I'm not sure whether you're talking. Ben's gonna talk first. Okay, on. there we go. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so that was just 
want to say uh, amazing and wonderful to hear both Edna and Evan talk about uh, their experiences with biofortified crops. And as you can <clears throat> hear, it's a journey. You know, there's a lot of different opportunities. And as you, as we start this journey together, and as you start it, uh, you'll continue to find um, new opportunities for innovation and for for additional marketing. In terms of how to go to market, and you can see this list here, we are able to help you understand what crops have already been released in your region or your country or even your district um, and are available. So what's the current supply? Who are the suppliers of those seeds or, or grains or foods? Um, and help you to establish a, a reliable supply chain. Uh, so if you're on the retail side, there's there's available food uh, companies who who would be interested in in using retail outlets. Or if you're a, a processor, there's there's farmers who need to sell uh, in two processors um, and are interested in doing so. Um, and if you're a farmer, there's there's people who are interested in in selling seed to you or or purchasing your grain. Uh, but one way that we've seen work very well for for businesses, especially on the food side, is food product renovation meaning taking an existing fruit product that you're working with, uh, if it might be cassava-based or maize-based or wheat-based or, or sorghum-based or millet-based, and then introducing, and introducing this new uh, variety into your supply chain. So you can very quickly take an existing product that you have and make it more nutritious simply by switching in a, a new variety of millet compared to an older variety of millet you might have. In addition, you can do food product innovation, meaning developing new products. So as Evan was talking about, finding new applications for vitamin A maize in the poultry sector, um, or as Edna was talking about this, you know, uh, developing um, food products that meet a certain need for a specific type of consumer that really needs nutrition at a certain phase of life. Um, developing those products is a, is a great way to meet some of these needs and find additional markets for for your products. And we always uh, are, are available to help guide in, in the best way to provide uh, truthful and legal product labeling and product marketing. These regulations can very much differ country by country, but there is a core aspect of it. And, and, and we are available to, to help with some of those, those guidelines. And now I'll turn it to, to Jenny to, to speak again a bit more about uh, nutrient-rich crops and, and the opportunity. Thanks, Ben. I'm, I'm, I'm envious, really, hearing from Evan and, and Edna about, you know, actually working with food. And um, you know, it's underestimated, really, the kind of uh, power that you have, that you're actually getting food to people that really makes a difference to nutrition and, and health and, to, and, and your businesses as well. So it's um, you know, you, you are making a difference. And I love the, I mean, it's obvious really, isn't it? If you if a food's good for humans, that's going to make humans healthy, it's going to be good for animals that you're going to make eggs and uh, meat uh, products healthy. But uh, just those kind of interactions of, of, of nutrient and rich foods, making eggs healthier and making chickens healthier so they're less susceptible to infection it's just you know it really is a remarkable product to be working in, in biofortification we touched on some of these elements before but nutrient and rich crops it's pushing on an open door with with consumers it's not like we're having to do a hard sell out of of, of creating a new product category of educating consumers of working with manufacturers about implementing complicated legislation and you know, large scale food fortification is a remarkable intervention in terms of it, it brings more nutrients into it, but it, you know, it's difficult and not all consumers um, uh, are receptive to um, fortification as they see it as additional um, nutrients on, on the label and, and consumers don't want complicated um, uh, labels. So the, what are benefits of, of biofortification nutrient and rich crops is it's, um, a natural source of vitamin A, of vitamin, um, of zinc or iron, so you don't have to list them in the, in the nutrition panel. Um, we talked about meat-free, so many people have a meat-free diet um, through necessity, because they can't afford meat, 
or some people have a meat-free diet because of um, religion or their beliefs around the way animals are, are raised and treated. Um, but more frequently, people are choosing meat-free because of environmental reasons or because of um, um, it's, it's, a, it's a trend that's not going away and there isn't enough meat and fish for everybody in the world. So having um, staple foods that contain as good nutrients as, as meat products is, is where we're trying to get to. Um, and many of you will have seen the the, um, the science and the media reports on the, on the meat-free industry. So beans, especially in millets, with them being high protein, have a really... Um, um, a good uh, opportunity in this space. Um, and then the whole ethical side of things, so you can talk to consumers about nutrition, so natural source rather than the nutritional health claims, which I'll come on to a bit, but working with something that's um, good for me as a consumer, but it's good for um, the people in my community. So um, especially with COVID, people are a lot more aware of um, um, our communities and the people that we work with and um, millennium generations want to buy products that have done something good in the world so there's that aspect to communicate to consumers as well and it's a long chain how somebody in, with who's quite well off can buy a product in, in a market um, that then has a, a, a benefit to a um, smallholder farmer even in a different country but the benefit is there on how being involved in, in biofortification um, benefits you, benefits your consumers, but also benefits other people in different parts of the world. Um, and then natural. So the whole um, trend around natural people wanting to eat natural foods, and this is these are global trends. You know whether you're a um, uh, you know you, you're shopping in Walmart in in Virginia in the US, or whether you're in Uganda at your local market. Everybody wants natural. Um, healthy food. It's um, it's one thing that we all have in common, and um, a trend that is is the same across the, across the world about wanting natural foods and superfoods, and wanting to really do your bit to make yourself as strong as possible, so that you're not getting COVID, and you're making your body healthy for for, for older age. So these are all the territories that you can talk about. Um, you know, pick one, you don't have to say them all, but especially, you know, how it works with your brand and portfolio. But these are the things that you can really talk about when commercializing biofortified foods. So Im importantly, um, we need standards, we need regulations, and we need laws in the value chain. So consumers um, are protected, but also from, from your perspective as commercializing foods, and it's, it's a level playing field. It's unfair if one person is saying my product cures blindness, whereas somebody else is saying my product will help prevent uh, night blindness because it contains um, vitamin A. So making sure that everybody is following the same rules. And um, within those rules, there's a lot of leeway. So you can talk about the same products in very different ways to different audiences. But there are standards available which will help you how to procure the grains. So, um, actually, it's the next slide, but um, there are standards around grains, there are standards around food labels, and there are standards around um, how to market the food. So, the whole value chain for biofortification is covered when it comes to um, standards and regulations. And years ago, even like five years ago, people would say, oh, it's a black hole, there's no standards out there for biofortified foods. Um, there's no standards for, for any of these things. How are we going to take them to market? But really, we were just looking in the wrong places. The standards were there already. They were already covered in like codex uh, regulations and labeling regulations. We've just interpreted them the wrong way. There was a gap at, at, at grain trade. So if you're buying the material, like many of you are, and you're going to farmers and you're going to your aggregator, you're going to your miller, you can say now, well, I want to your a, a ingredients or I want my cassava that conforms to this PAS, which is a publicly available specification, and it dictates the amount of nutrients that should be there in the grain so that it transfers to the finished food so that you know you're buying the right ingredient that's going to make a food that contains um, enough to actually talk to the consumer about. But um, we've created 
guides, very um, easy to follow guides that show you what the regulations are, um, how it interacts with other regulations like fortification, and what you can say on a, on a package um, that's like truthful but also impactful. Next slide. Importantly, to remember that um, nutrient rich crops or biofortification through conventional breeding does not require any special treatment. So there's no special regulation for nutrient rich crops or biofortified crops. Genetic modification is different and there are special provisions, but we're not talking about that context today. Um, so nutrient rich crops through the Harvest Plus program or in the, in the countries where you are can be produced, sold and labelled in the same way as other foods. So there's nothing weird or crazy about nutrient rich crops. There's no like tampering or, um, or any sort of um, anything that consumers need to be worried about um, and say do not use the word biofortification to talk to consumers. So we're really like phasing out the word biofortification. But having good food labelling will help you sell more products. So it's, it's not just something that's going to hold you back. There's so much to talk about with consumers and having a product that's um, well labelled, simply labelled, which tells the truth. It's not just about avoiding prosecution but it's about building a connection with your customer, with your consumer, who's going to buy that product in the market so that they feel connected to you as a manufacturer, they know who you are, they know where you are, and they know what you're selling. It will build trust with your, um, with your consumers and enable you to sell more, um, more products. So the next slide. You there, ben. So um, I won't go into these in great detail, but when you're talking about vitamin A and you're talking about iron and you're talking about zinc, there are authorised um, functional claims to talk about. So you have a nutrition claim which just talks about the, um, the vitamin A content, so it might say 50% of the recommended daily amount of vitamin A in this food. But then there are all these benefits of vitamin A. And don't feel like you have to say all of them. You could really focus in on one attribute of vitamin A. So, for example, vitamin A contributes to the maintenance of normal vision and really important for growing children. You can make that into a message that talks about um, eyesight in a responsible way and um, a playful way of being able to see in the dark. So my parents always told me, you know, if you eat your carrots, you're going to be able to, you'll see in the dark. And I thought they were making up. It's just a silly story. But it's true. It's a tenuous link. But if you don't get enough vitamin A, you are more susceptible to night blindness. So if you eat foods that are rich in vitamin A and orange foods, um, you're not going to get night blindness. So there's just a whole like product category you can have there about talking about eyesight. But you can talk about skin with, with um, different groups of, especially women who are, who are um, interested in products for their um, their skin health. Um, immune system, really important at the moment. So, you know, how to keep a healthy immune system with the food you eat. Um, so I'll move on to, I think iron is the next one. Different functions of iron, but immunity, again, is really important there. And if you see a pattern in malnutrition of these three critical nutrients are all linked with immunity. So when you don't have these, vitamins and minerals in your diet, you are more susceptible to disease. Um, but again, there's a whole category you can talk about with iron. So I think most of us will know the you know, iron contributes to being, um, having energy, being strong. So talking to kids about um, you know, being strong and being healthy and being good at school and being sporty. Talking to mothers about um, uh, being healthy in pregnancy. Uh, and then finally, um, zinc. Um, zinc has different benefits. There's a whole category again that talks about the benefits of, of zinc, immunity again, but zinc is very important in, in many of the um, um, skin, hair and nails. So you can talk about um, like the benefits of zinc in that context. But depending on your portfolio of foods, whatever it is you're selling, whether you're um, and who your target audience is, you can tailor these benefits to who you're specifically talking to. Ben's going to talk to you about um, another way to talk to consumers through, through a logo. 
Thanks, Jenny. Um, yeah, I'll talk a bit about this and I'll talk about it in the context of a question that we received in the chat actually to hope, hopefully help make it real world and actionable for everyone. So there was a question about where does the PAS standards come in? How does that get implemented? And then how can you market and, and in, in a sense certify uh, biofortified crops? This uh, journey that we've been explaining thus far gives you a bit of insight into that. So you establish the standard, which as Jenny showed, goes all the way across the value chain. And so then you know what is and is not a naturally nutritious staple crop at various stages. And the way that we determine what is and is not is, will this have a positive nutritional impact on people's health? So ensuring that we're getting to a sufficient amount of nutrient in order to really have that benefit. You implement the standard and then you're able to hold people to the standard with things like this food product logo. So this is one way that Harvest Plus helps businesses communicate to consumers that their product is in fact more nutritious. This is not a, a product nu nutrient claim, meaning there are specific nutrients claims such as source of iron, high in iron. This is not doing that because it's not linked to a specific quantity Rather, it's providing consumers with the awareness that this is a more nutritious product across the value chain. And that's just one of many different tools that Harvest Plus has to offer businesses when it comes to commercializing biofortified crops. We have a lot of information about market analysis. We, we understand the crop development pipeline. We know where these varieties are. We can assist with the development of varieties. Uh, we can provide information around grain, supply availability, uh, as we've already spoke to, we established these standards to help businesses across the value chain understand if they're dealing with a naturally nutritious product. Providing consumer insights is also something that we've done for some time. Um, biofortified crops have been marketed by us essentially based off of consumer insights on the farmer side and on the consumer side. Um, and we can certainly share that information and work together on developing that information for new markets food product development. You can see the whole list here. Um, it's really, uh, we have the services and expertise to be able to work across the value chain in a number of different countries around the world and really have more detailed conversations on helping you commercialize biofortified crops because we're in this together. And uh, Jenny, I think you'll speak to, to this at the last. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks, Ben. Um Another thing that my um, my mum used to tell me when I was growing up, because I really wanted curly hair, is that if I ate the crust on my bread, I would get curly hair. So I, I hated um, like starchy food, but I started eating bread and importantly the crust of bread because you <laughs> eat all your food up. But I never got curly hair. So there are a lot of um, like myths and and stories about eating food that. You, you that go through families that you know you wouldn't put on food packaging, but there's always a story to be told about the food that you're making and you're selling. Um, so to give the summary before we go into our breakout groups, um, uh, nutrient image crops are are there for you to commercialize and are there for you to make a business, and they are lying in the fastest growing consumer trends. You're pushing on an open door. You're not trying to do something complicated. Um, and they really can and will provide value to your business and help your business grow through selling food that consumers really want. And in doing that work, you will not only be making the, your customers um, uh, healthier and having access to better foods, but you will have a net impact on the food system in general. Um, and you know, don't underestimate the power that you have through procuring these foods and actually talking about them and talking to the consumers. It really will have a, a net benefit um, on your local community, but also the wider community food system. Um, be clear on your audience. So I've, I've given a lot of examples and information about what these nutrients do, but you know, pick one nutrient and pick one benefit and just tell that story well. So use really simple messages. You even just use the logo or just say this um, food contains iron and you need iron for energy and talk about energy. Um, so uh, keep it simple. Uh, consumers, whether they're, you're a busy mother and you're not even 
don't have time to look at the menu, at the, the, the label, or in some cases, you can't read the label, or whether you're from another country with a lot of time and a lot of money, people don't read messages. They're just focusing on one message or one, um, one logo. So you know, keep it simple. Um, tell the truth. There's no need to exaggerate. So you don't have to say that the food will make your hair curly, but you can say that the food will help you see in the dark. Um, you can say that it will keep you um, uh, keep you energetic. And also, the, the different country legislation, it, the big picture-wise, it's always the same, but there's, it's different on a country-by-country -country basis. And there's very specific ways to do your nutrition panel, your nutrition claims, and your health claims, and we're here to help you. Um, to do that and we have um, simple guides to help you and um, we can show you best practice um, uh, label. Uh, so they tick all the boxes, the biggest health trends. So, um, you know, get out there and demand biofortified commodities and find your supply chain and we'll help you and um, you sell more products and um, more to talk to you about, but, you know, really good luck and um, thanks for being here and uh, learning more about biofortified and look forward to um, chatting with you in the breakout. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jenny and Ben. That was wonderful. Um, really compelling. We're about to go into some breakout groups so people can share a little bit about where they see the opportunity for themselves and uh, ask some questions. So I've got that set up. I know if I was an entrepreneur, I'd be saying, where am I going to go and get this extra information? How do I stay in touch? I know that's a question. So perhaps do you want to just Hit that one now, um, or do you want to save it till the very end? That's where I'm gonna. Like, what do I? What do I do as my next step here? So we, we have all of the like the documents and the information that we can share through the food portal. And I know we were talked about um, putting them all together in like a Dropbox folder so everyone can access it. Um, and then also just get in touch with us directly. And then we have representatives in many of our markets. So um, good luck. Ogu is the um, our country managers in, in Nigeria, and he's always happy to hear from, from people who, you know, where they want to get seeds from. But um, lots of different access points to um, get more information. Um, but we will most definitely circulate the basics to, to this group and then through the, the website and um, get in touch. Fantastic. Okay, so we'll put extra information up on the Good Food Hub, and then they can people can contact you, and you will put them in touch with a, the right local representative who can guide them through their local access in their local market. Super. Well, let's go into breakout rooms now. This is a chance for you to all have a chat. I've divided you up into two groups: one group with Ben and Edna, the other with Jenny and Evan. And uh, yeah, it's just fifteen minutes or so just to have a just flag. You know, what do you see as the opportunity and any questions you've got? And we'll it'll go fast and furious, but uh, let's give it a go. I'm going to send you to the rooms now. There were some good questions. I was dipping between the two sessions. We had some good questions. Um, I don't know whether Ben and Jenny, whether you want to just take a minute to run through any of the kind of key highlights from each of your breakout groups. Um, we talked about um, Evan's... Um, plan of how he you know, got started and uh, you know how he actually you know he one thing that stuck out for me is you know he just had a really like gut feeling that this was going to work and he knew that he had a good product and you know that's you can do a lot of research and invest in a lot of consumer research but sometimes you just know you've got a good idea yeah, um, the entrepreneur. <laughs> well the other thing too is you just have to believe and you need to test it and because like no amount of consumer research is actually going to predict what's successful. Like if it, if it did, then, you know, like every product company's launch would be successful. And we know that's not the case. So you just, you just have to try and accept that probably a lot of your ideas are not going to be um, exactly correct and just iterate. So just, you know, that's, that's my biggest advice to entrepreneurs is, is try things, you know, maybe try small test hypotheses and build from there. You know um, that's, that's a great way to, to get going. Great. One of my favorite phrases for entrepreneurs is the answer to how is yes. It's just to say, just give it a go and you'll figure it out as you head on the journey. Ben, anything from your group? It's an excellent discussion on, on the tools that are available to help businesses work through the value chain when it comes to the standards. 
Um, and so, so Jenny, I think those, those standards are very appreciated and, and the ability to understand how you communicate that this is a more nutritious product to consumers is a really important aspect of, of, the, of what people are interested in. And then the question came, how can we learn more? What help is available? Um, in the specific markets we were talking about, India and Nigeria, we do have the ability to, to ha have meetings and with teams on the ground and really provide a more facilitative approach. But also if you're in any other country or around the world for that matter, we have the, the tools, the understanding of the policy, the availability of varieties to help businesses understand what's available, what things they can and cannot say and how they can commercialize naturally nutritious staple crops through their businesses and, and really make it a positive impact on their business and a positive impact on the world. And we're excited to take that journey uh, together with everyone. I think that's one of the, the questions uh, that was just put in the chat is what are the challenges? And I think one of the biggest challenges that we see is we don't have spaces like this where entrepreneurs can come together, talk about some of these issues and really just interact with one another. So I think on the journey, we're excited to, to go together with everyone and and staying in touch on the Good Food Hub and staying in touch through Harvest Plus's uh, own networks. Uh, we're very excited to continue this conversation going forward. We'll include our emails and everything in the chat and in the materials. So please feel free to reach out. Uh, well, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to have you here sharing this. this is a real, very practical business opportunity for Good Food Hub members. It's been a delight. And, you know, as an next step, we'll post a summary of this, we'll put the video up, but we'll also put the links both to the resources that you have and then your email addresses so that people that want to help can get in touch and you will introduce them to the right person in their geography. So that seems like a, the very concrete next step to tap into the local expertise. Um, so yeah, we'll certainly do that and we'll keep this chat going. I almost wonder whether we need a little, we can have a, a, a group uh, that we could set up on the hub if we want to do with entrepreneurs working on this so they can uh, connect with each other and ask their peers question. That'd be a nice thing to do. I don't, we'll see whether it takes, but it'd be easy thing to set up. Um, thanks everybody for joining today. Um, yeah, and uh, our time is up, but, and thanks so much, Evan and Edna for sharing your insights and good luck. I know you contributed as well in that session as the, the, the man to go to in Nigeria. Uh, so <laughs> hopefully you'll, you. you'll be getting some new people are reaching out to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. Bye bye. Thank Great. You. Bye, everyone. <laughs> let's get bye. 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 Yeah, let's get by 45. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.